I'm a professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the U of A, and um, um, uh, an active uh, family practitioner. And I know that I have some people with alpha-1 in my practice, but I don't know who they are. Um, so the, the topic that I, uh, is dear to my heart is how to screening. Screening is finding people uh, out there who have a condition um, that uh, we don't know about. So if we went out on the street uh, and took everybody's blood pressure, that would be screening for blood pressure, okay? Um, so how would we screen for alpha-1 in, in, in general practice? Oh, sorry, I have to make this declaration of interest. Um, College of Family Physicians is very strict about this. Um, I'm doing a study at the moment trying to find out what's the best way to uh, screen for people with alpha-1 in family practice. And that uh, study is funded by Griffold. Um, the study is my own design with uh, a couple of colleagues, uh, Dr. Myers, Dr. Wong. Um, Griffoles didn't design the study, have no influence on what we do, um, but they do fund it. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. Um, okay, screening in family practice. Um, in general terms, what is it worth screening for? First of all, it has to be a common enough condition. Um, screening for Rocky Mountain spotted fever um, would probably take a lot of resources and um, wouldn't find very many people. Uh, although um, there are more in Alberta than in the UK where I trained. I remember I was doing my uh, MD exam and uh, going over it all with my wife and um, there were examples of tick-borne fevers uh, and there was Japanese mountain fever and Rocky Mountain spotted fever and she said, what on earth are you learning this stuff for? You'll never need this. So 40 years later, when I came to Alberta, well, that's why you learn about Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, but I haven't seen anybody with it yet. Um, uh, so it has to be a common condition to, to be worth screening for. And it's no use finding it out if you can't do anything about it. So it, uh, it, that would be just cruel. To find out someone's got a disease you can't do anything about would be um, unethical. Um, and it's got to be treatable or preventable. Um, um, so pap smears, for example, uh, are done because uh, there's something we can do about it before people get cancer. Um, it has to have a long lag time. In other words, it's no use finding out today that you've got something that kills you tomorrow. Uh, that's a little bit late. So um, as with pap smears, uh, the, when um, you have an abnormal pap smear, it might be 20 years before you get cancer. Um, and so there's time to intervene. And so uh, you need a, a, a long lag time. So uh, if we find out a condition like hypertension, blood pressure, blood pressure doesn't do you any harm. It's the stroke at the end that kills you. Uh, but you have time to intervene and get the blood pressure down so the person doesn't have the stroke. Um, the test has to be accurate. It has to be, we have to be sure that you've got the condition or you've not got the condition. So um, blood pressure machines that um, you buy off, off the net or that uh, somebody gave you as a present years ago um, are not reliable for taking blood pressure. Uh, they don't tell you if your blood pressure is uh, good enough. Thermometers, you know, remember, take kids' thermometers, the ones you used to put under your tongue, the one you stick in the air, all those ones. The accuracy has to be there, otherwise it's um, uh, not only a waste of time, it, it can cause problems. But the test has to be also cheap, so that if Alberta Health is paying for it, um, uh, you can have um, colonoscopy for your, uh, to detect cancer of the bowel. It's not cheap, uh, it's getting cheaper, uh, but it's quite invasive. <laughs> um, um, would you rather do one of those little poop tests? <laughs> uh, it's a little less invasive and much cheaper. Um, so uh, the test that we choose for screening has to be uh, cheap uh, and acceptable to patients. I mean, would you go and do this, that, and the other? Would you go and have a colonoscopy every six months? Um, you know, 
um, to, to just be, be on the safe side. So it's got to be acceptable. So those are the sort of rules for screening. So alpha-1, is that common? Well, as a genetic disease, it's one of the commonest. Uh, for, for if Diane Cox was here, unfortunately she's, uh, she's not, but you know, it, it's a common, it, for the geneticists, it's common. Uh, there's a lot of people about with it. Um, but for the rest of us, it's not. I don't have, the, the, there are, in Europe, one in 3,000 to one in 5,000 people have alpha-1, that's the ZZ version. In fact, 125,000 people in Europe are ZZ uh, uh, um, positive. So, and that's out of 535 million, you can do the math, it comes out something like one in 5,000, okay? Um, but it varies from country to country. In North America, it's one in five and a half thousand. Um, but in Scandinavia, it's one in 1,600. It's much more common in Scandinavia than it is here. Uh, and because that's it's a genetic disease, and obviously they, the Vikings uh, carry this gene more than the rest of us do. Um, but it's rare in people of Chinese descent. Um, it's not worth screening Chinese people for it. You'd be testing five million to get one sort of thing. So um, uh, we wouldn't screen Chinese descent. But when you look at a particular group, patients with COPD, it's between two and five percent different studies show. So average about four percent of patients who have COPD will have alpha-1 deficiency, ZZ, the, the active um, form. That's nice. We've worked that out with small groups of patients with COPD and patients have looked at them, but they did a study in St. Uh, St. Louis um, looking at the population and they expected to find uh, by the math 7,000 people uh, but only 250 or something of them were actually identified on any register anywhere. So of all the patients with COPD who have alpha-1 we've only identified 4% of them. So Jim and uh, the alpha-1 registry is so important but it's it's tiny compared to the number of people out there who actually have it. And that's because we're not looking for it, okay? Um, obviously, it's higher in people who develop COPD early. So if someone smokes two packs a day for 40 years, guess what, they'll probably get COPD, okay? But if they never smoked and they got COPD at 30, then bells should go off that this is abnormal and maybe they have alpha-1 deficiency. Um, so people get COPD early or people who uh, have never smoked uh, and get COPD. Um, there was a presentation um, by Griffalls just two days ago here in Edmonton to uh, family physicians. There are about 20 odd family physicians in the group who the last time they heard about Alpha One was when they were med students. Um, so they're not suspicious. Um, we're not uh, aware, we're not looking for them. Well, is it treatable? That's the next thing before we screen for it. Well, it is treatable. Even before augmentation therapy, there are things we can do about this. When I was in med school 100 years ago, um, a person with COPD was a little old man in a corner smoking a pipe and coughing up green stuff. <laughs> you know, well. But the, 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 there are now as many women with COPD as men, and they're younger. And the, one of my colleagues has a, a picture of a model going down the runway, and she's about mm -hmm. 35, so cracking piece of stuff. Um, uh, and she has COPD, because she smoked for 20 years to keep her weight down. So the model of patients that we're looking for is with COPD is different. And if we don't spot the COPD, we'll never spot the alpha ones. And the first thing to do if somebody has uh, uh, alpha one is don't smoke. Because smoking seriously increases your chances of getting bad COPD. Okay, well, yeah, don't smoke. Nobody, you know. 
I can get between 5 and 10% of my patients to give up smoking if I nag them every time they come in. But in a Swedish study, when they tested people for alpha-1 and told them you're alpha-1 positive, you're ZZ, 50% gave up. Okay? And when their kids heard about it, less of those kids started smoking than kids who, who did not know that they had alpha-1 in the family. So screening works and it, uh, uh, um, in it makes it the disease treatable. So give up smoking, it works. The next thing you should, everyone should do is have the flu shots and they should have pneumococcal vaccine every 10 years, okay? Um, and if they get a chest infection, it should be treated early with antibiotics. If it's a bacterial infection, you know, green sputum and, um, and tested positive for bugs, it should be treated early with antibiotics instead of leaving people to damage their lungs. The, um, I don't know where you're all at, so, so if, if, um, if you all know this already, um, uh, you can nod off. Um, the, the <laughs> patients with alpha-1 deficiency don't make alpha-1, which is a trypsin which protects the lung from damage, okay, when you get infections. The, there are pre chemical uh, proteins produced when you get an infection which damage your lung tissue. Alpha-1 protects you. If you don't have it, the lung gets damaged. So every time you get an infection, you get more damaged lung, okay? And that's why you end up with emphysema. Instead of having a lung that looks like a sponge, you have one that looks like a sponge that someone's pulled the middle out of it, you know, big holes, okay? So if they get infection, you can, we can treat people early. So it's worth knowing you have alpha-1. And of course, uh, there's an associated risk of getting liver disease. Um, I, I apologize to all the mums uh, and dads of, of kids. My practice is getting older like I am, and so I, I don't see many kids, and so I, I don't know much about the, the detecting it um, um, alpha-1 in children, except that they've done some good studies where, uh, uh, doing heel pricks on babies you know, as soon as they're born. Uh, again, it's sort of worthwhile in Scandinavia, um, or in uh, kids who, ha who have jaundice in the first week of life, it might be worth doing it. But I, 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 I only know anything about COPD, really. Uh, but obviously, someone who's got alpha-1 should cut back on the alcohol. We don't want to give them any more liver damage. Um, if uh, people get, they should be managed uh, like we would manage anybody with COPD. Um, they should do, learn some pulmonary rehab, be sent for pulmonary rehab. Uh, for the exercise to keep the muscles going, as Dr. Yat was saying, you need your muscles, and oxygen therapy if needed. So they need referral. If necessary, they can have augmentation therapy. Um, um, Ben's going to talk about that later, about uh, when that's indicated. And it, it, the indication varies from country to country at the moment. They may need a lung and liver transplant. Um, lung resections. Um, um, not as effective with alpha-1 patients with uh, COPD as other patients with COPD. Because with alpha-1, it's the bottom of the lungs that really get damaged, get the emphysema, whereas other COPDs, it's the upper end, and taking that a bit out uh, works better than taking the lower bit out. So uh, lung resection isn't so good, but if you've got the liver disease, liver transplant obviously works, because the liver is where the problem is, Part of the problem is that the chemicals that, uh, the, when you have alpha-1 deficiency, you can't get rid of the, the, the chemicals out of your liver, and your liver gets basically clogged up. So if you get a new liver, and you've got some, uh, making some alpha-1, then uh, you, you, uh, it's quite successful. If you get that bad that you need liver transplant, which shouldn't be undertaken lightly, obviously. And the next thing you can do, of course, is advise your brothers and sisters to get tested. If you have ZZ, then you, both your parents must have had a Z each for, to come together to give you ZZ, okay? Um, out of four children, one will have M from mum and Z from dad, and one will have Z from mum and M from dad, so there should be two MZs. There should be one MM and there should be one ZZ on average. But it doesn't work like that. That's how Mendel did it with his peas. 
you know, because you have thousands of peas growing. Um, but um, you might have a brother or a sister who's also ZZ. It depends what time of day your parents got together. You know, I don't know. Um, I don't know. It depends on that, actually. <laughs> I have no evidence for that statement. Please rub that statement. <laughs> But, um, uh, but your children will only get one Z from you. And if your partner uh, is MM, your children will be carriers, but won't be ZZ. It'd be really hard luck uh, if you married someone ZZ and your children got it. Um, so siblings are more important than children uh, to be tested, OK? But all these people, it's treated. These are things we can do if we identify it. So is it worth identifying it? OK, I think so. Is there a long lag time? By this, I don't mean the delay in making the diagnosis. As you all know, the average is 8 to 10 years before the diagnosis is made that people have had symptoms. Uh, and that's partly our suspicion and partly that we think it's because you were smoking that you got such crappy lungs. OK. Um, the other snag is that a lot of people who develop uh, lung disease from their alpha-1 deficiency doesn't show up, doesn't present to the doctors until they're in their 30s and 40s, 30s and 40s, okay. Same with COPD. All my smokers have, who smoke more than a pack a day, have lung damage. And they have symptoms, but they don't come to me with them because it's just a smoker's cough, doc. I can't go up the stairs because I smoke so much, okay? So they don't present till they're actually quite sick. And similarly with people with alpha-1, ah, this, this 20-year-old has had, he's had a bad chest while he was running in the rain, you know, so it's, it's okay. Um, it, 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 but by the time they're 30 or 40 and they've had three serious chest infections, something should be going on in the doctor's head um, to make them think that this might be alpha-1. But there's time, if we found out at 20, that he was ZZ, there's time to intervene before the lung damage develops. So we could be getting them on the flu shots, we could get them to stop smoking, etc., uh, between 20 and 40 and stop their lung disease. Is, is it an accurate, cheap, and acceptable test? Well, it's a simple venous blood sample. In, in Alberta, all the Dynacare Casper labs, if the doctor writes a requisition, they'll take the sample uh, and it'll be performed in the lab if um, I'm, I'm using the micromoles per liter uh, scores here, um, you, you can also get milligrams per liter, uh, which is a different numbers. But if in, in uh, micromoles, if it's less than most of us will have uh, a level above 50. Okay, if it's 17, uh, if it's less than 17, I'm thinking this patient might have MZ or SZ, one of the uh, the variants. But if it's less than 12, we know that that puts you at high risk, uh, and you're probably a ZZ. Okay, so simple test, as um, uh, Jim said, back in back in 12 hours. Uh, well, but, uh, the test is, is done in 12 hours, and the result goes back to GP, who may or may not know how significant that is. He may say, "Oh, got a value of 10. Is that good?" Um, don't know. Um, may have to uh, refer, refer a patient. But once you've got uh, a low level below 17, you can have the blood spot test for phenotype, which tells us are you ZZ, MZ, SZ, or whatever, OK? And you can have this done, um, thank you to um, Griffalls, by a simple blood spot test. You just put a spot of blood on a card and mail it off to Florida and they do the test for you for free. And that's a, a service they provide to all the GPs. If you want the genotype, you want to actually look at the genes, um, then you can send the blood, or if you want to do the, the phenotype, you, the blood can be sent to Montreal or Vancouver or um, um, Mr. Saga now in, in Ontario. Um, and they, they do the test there. Diane Cox used to do it in her lab here. And in the study we started, we were going to have all the samples sent to her, but Alberta Health said, well, this is, you're going to care for patients as a result of this test, and it's only a research lab. We don't accept research lab 
tests as um, valid for, for giving treatment. You have to send it to a clinical lab. So we have to send all our samples off to Vancouver. But it's easy to do. There's no hassle. Uh, the people who do it know what they're talking about. Um, uh, and you can eat it. So it sounds like screening might, for alpha-1 might be worthwhile. Okay. So who should we screen? Well, the American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society got together in 2003 and published it in this AJR Citizen just means the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine or something. But, okay, but that was 2003. And what they recommended was all adults with COPD or emphysema should have the test. Should have the simple blood test. Costs uh, 15 bucks, okay? Uh, not expensive. They also suggested that adults with asthma who didn't open up when they took the puffer, in other words, had some fixed obstruction that didn't respond, might also have COPD and may also therefore have alpha-1. So they suggested ad adult asthmatics sh should be tested if they didn't clear up when you gave them the puffer, if they didn't open up. Um, they also said anyone, whether they're uh, uh, asthmatic or not, who has fixed obstruction, especially if they were a non-smoker, uh, should be tested. Why have they got fixed obstruction? Maybe it's alpha-1. Um, especially if they had, they had a fixed obstruction and a risk factor, risk factors being things that cause it, like smoking or occupational exposure. Um, anybody who comes in with unexplained liver disease, they come in and you, a bit suspicious, you do the blood test, find they've got a bit of liver disease uh, in their 20s, and they're more Mormon and never touched a drop of liquor in their life, or, or then what's going on? We should be thinking, is this alpha one? And they also recommended that the brothers and sisters of people with alpha one should be tested for the reasons that we just talked about. And adults with necrotizing paniculitis. Has anybody here got necrotizing paniculitis? No, I don't think so. Uh, it's a very rare condition, really, which uh, affects affects the tissues below your skin, and they sort of, for want of a better word, they rot. Um, if I see someone with that, I'll be testing them for alpha-1, but I don't think I'll see one in my practice. But it does happen. So they, that, that was their guidelines. These people should be tested. So with that in mind, I wanted to find out if screening in family practice was doable, if we could uh, implement this test. Uh, and, and raise the awareness and get GPs to test. So our aim was that we'd uh, find a thousand patients um, and test uh, uh, and, and see if it worked before we did a national uh, um, program uh, around three, three, three or four provinces. Um, so we modified who we looked at according to, we read all the literature and disagreed a little bit with the American Thoracic Society. So we said, Anybody who gets COPD before 55, if they're a non-smoker, they shouldn't be getting COPD before 55. Maybe they have alpha-1. Okay, we'll test them. Even if you're a smoker, you shouldn't be getting COPD before 40. So anyone who gets COPD before 40, whether a smoker or not, we'll be testing them. Or smokers with, who have COPD at any age, but they have a family history of lung or liver disease as well. We're going to test them or family members, uh, parents and children we decided to test as well as um, siblings. We, w we were sort of not totally convinced about not testing the children, um, so we decided to include them as well. Certainly include anybody with COPD who is of Scandinavian descent, because it's more common uh, in them, uh, and we'd, anybody who had uh, Chinese descent we wouldn't test. So we went a little bit off the, uh, off the beaten track. We made our own rules who we're going to test, but it was all based on uh, what was in the literature. So we approached 13 practices so far. Uh, seven practices agreed to take part, but one had to drop out because three of the doctors suddenly left. Um, one practice agreed, but none of the physicians have invited any patients. So at the moment, we've got 20 physicians who are taking part. 
we're not sure yet because we haven't got the result, how many patients with COPD they have. We don't know how many patients have invited, but we will do by the uh, next couple of months. Uh, and of those patients invited, how many patients agreed to have the test? What we did was we got the doctor to send out a letter to all, his, all the patients we identified before, COPD patients, inviting them to come and have the test, and he'd explain it to them and then uh, get a consent, give them the requisition to take to the lab. Well, a lot of the patients who were invited did not come to see the doctor, and some of those who had it explained to them said, no thanks, and I'm sure you can tell me why. Okay. Because, don't want to know, okay? There's implications when you next fill out your insurance form, have you got any conditions? Yeah, I've got alpha one, uh-oh, <laughs> down goes your insurability, okay? Um, in, in the States, you cannot uh, wait in insurance because someone has alpha one, but in Canada, there's no such rule, okay? So we don't know how many patients have responded. So far, we know that 25 patients have actually gone and been tested. Um, we have no patients so far out of 25 who've got ZZ. And one patient is heterozygous. We don't know what it is. The blood sample's been sent away to see if it's SZ or MZ or whatever it is. Um, so it um, doesn't look like it's going to be a great way of finding patients with alpha-1. Eh? Well, that's a good finding. We won't waste time doing it. Okay. But the, these are the problems that we came across. We've talked to the GPs about the problem. I've no time to do it no time to be involved in the study. That's why some of the practices said no thanks. They'd been in other studies about asthma and things with us, but this was going to take some time. The doctor would actually have to see the patient and explain the test to them. When the test came back, the doctor would have to see the patient and say, you've got your test result back, your, your blood level's 40, you're fine, you don't have to bother about anything, um, or your blood's bad, I'm making a referral for you to see the specialist. So, oh no, I don't want to get involved in using, you know, spending that much time. Um, and they didn't have anybody in the office who'd do it for them, like a nurse. Most family docs don't have a nurse. Uh, those who do, it's because they're in a primary care network, and those nurses, their job has been defined already, so taking on an extra job wasn't possible. The big one was, family doctors don't know who their COPD patients are. We know that 10% of the population have COPD. So if I've got a thousand patients in my practice, I should have a hundred with COPD. Well, as I said before, half of them are, are early COPD and have not come to see me about their chest problems. They just cough every morning and they can't go up a flight of stairs um, and they smoke. Um, so I don't know that they have COPD. So when we went to doctor's offices, even our Docs who most in Alberta it's much more common than anywhere else have electronic medical record. Okay, when when I see a patient with uh, diabetes, uh, fill in the chart, press diabetes. That's what I saw them about today. It goes to Alberta Health for billing. Uh, I saw a patient with diabetes, so I can get paid for that. Um, but uh, um, does their computer system record that or keep it? list of all the patients with diabetes. It doesn't keep a list, of, most doctors' records don't keep a list of who their COPD patients are, or if it does, the doc can't get it out. If I go to my computer now um, and say, give me a list of my patients who I've billed for COPD, you know, after about half an hour of churning around and getting um, my secretary to do it who knows more about it than me, um, we can get a list of patients who got COPD but it's not the 100 I should be having. It's sort of 35. So wh what about the other 65? Where are they? Okay. Then we did a little study. I had a student come over from uh, Holland uh, because I worked with a, a colleague there who's interested in COPD as well. And we looked at all the GPs uh, that we could get hold of um, to see if all their patients with COPD have ever had spirometry because um, a lot of the diagnosis for COPD 
it has been made clinically. The, doc, the, uh, the family doc has said, this patient's got COPD because they've had, they get bronchitis every winter, coughing up green stuff, uh, and they're, they're limited in how much they're puffing and blowing as they walk sort of thing. But they've never had spirometry, which is a lung test, which you have to have certain values on your lung test to say you've got COPD. It might be asthma, it might be bronchiectasis, it might be TB. If you don't get the, the spirometry, you can't actually say it's COPD. So um, Micah did, uh, went around all the practices and looked at their charts of patients the doctor said had COPD. So out of my 35, I looked at the, the, them uh, to see in their chart if they've ever had the lung test. And it varies tremendously from practice to practice. Some docs only had 10% of their patients that they said had COPD had ever actually been tested. One practice, it had an average of 95% of their patients. Brilliant practice. But we looked at the individual doctors, and one doctor had 100%, another doctor had 95% or something. One doctor in the same practice only had 50% tested. So what's that about? You know, if, if they routinely do it, why is this guy so far behind? Anyway, so many COPD patients have never had spirometry. We don't know that officially they've got COPD. The GPs were concerned about the confidentiality of using their list of patients, if, if your GP wrote to you today and said you've got COPD, would you like to come and have an alpha test? Would you be offended? Some of the GPs said, well, I, I, I think my patients would be very upset because I'm using the fact I know they've got COPD um, for a study. Now, if it was to improve your health, like, I know you're a 35-year-old female and you have never had a pap smear, please come in. Well, they'd be happier about that. But suggesting someone come in for what was a research study, they weren't happy about, okay? Um, they were also worried about the responsibility of finding out that someone had alpha-1. I don't know what to do with it if I find it. Well, okay, you don't have to know what to do with it. You send them to the man who does, okay? Um, so, but they were worried about it. So that's another reason the family physicians aren't keen to do this. The patients were worried about the label. So that's why some of the patients who were invited didn't come. They didn't want to know that they had alpha-1 deficiency because of the implication. And I think the fact that we didn't follow the guidelines, we made up our own guidelines who would be tested, leave out Chinese, include, make sure if Scandinavians are in da 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 da, -da was too complicated and they, they couldn't couldn't cope with that. So I think those are problems why we don't find it. And if we were going to do screening in family practice in future, we'd have to modify what we did. And how will we modify it? Well, what happens in other countries? I just was, last weekend I was in um, Stockholm where there's, we had the international meeting. There are um, 29 countries uh, in this sort of consortium uh, of GPs who are interested in respiratory disease. There were 190 of us there, came from 29 countries, and over dinner, I asked them. Now, um, alpha-1 is rare in Chinese descent. So my colleague from Vietnam, Vin, said, no, we don't routinely test. From Singapore, no. Australia, no. OK, moving across. Pakistan, asked Osman, no. Getting into Europe, Greece, no. Spain, no. Holland, no. UK, certainly not, but Rupert does. He's keen on it. Um, <laughs> and Dr. Stockley, Robert Stockley, oh, don't go near him if you haven't tested your patients for, C for Alpha 1. Okay, he's, he's one of the gurus of Alpha 1 in, in the UK, is Dr. Stockley. Sweden, these are Scandinavians. Spoke to Karen and Bjorn. No, nobody tests routinely their COPD patients. What did the guidelines say? All adults with COPD or emphysema should be tested. Nobody's doing it. Canada, no. Okay. So this time, well, January last year, the Canadian Thoracic Society came out with guidelines for uh, testing and treating um, alpha-1. 
they simplified it a little bit and they said, recommendation number one, test individuals with CO, who get COPD before 65. Not all patients, but if you're over 65, you probably got it because you deserved it because you smoked two packs a day, okay? Um, and you, it's unlikely that if you got, uh, if you didn't get, if you had alpha-1, you'd get COPD before 65, okay? But test individuals with COPD who don't, who've never smoked, okay, who've only smoked a little bit, and they set the standard as 20 pack years, that's a pack a day for 20 years. That's quite a bit of smoking. So that's quite high. I always said individuals with COPD who've only smoked 100 cigarettes in their life or something like that. But I was on that panel and we disagreed with that, but that's what the average, uh, that's what the consensus was. And the second one was don't test individuals with asthma uh, or bronchiectasis because the lung problem that you get with alpha-1 is emphysema, not bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis is not indication. Asthma is not indication, unless they're one of those asthma patients who don't open up when you give them the Ventolin, okay? That suggests they've got some fix. But they also added, warn people of the psychological problem. How stressful is it? And uh, Dr. Stern's gonna talk about it this afternoon. How stressful is it to know you've got alpha-1? Okay, and about the insurance discrimination. So before you test someone, they have to know what they're getting into. Remember when I was in uh, the UK and HIV came out and people were rushing to have their HIV test and then all of a sudden they were rushing not to have their HIV test <laughs> because the insurance companies said, uh, okay, your HIV test was negative, but why did you go have it? You must think you're at risk. <laughs> you must have been playing around a bit. <laughs> so we're going to wait your policy. Just a minute, you know. So um, same with Alpha One. You know, do you want to have the test or don't you? Okay, we should think about it. So finally, what should we do about it? Okay, so let's look at the patients. If you've got Alpha One or you've got family members, ask your family doctor for the brothers and sisters to be screened. Okay, they can hardly refuse. Ask a family doctor for your annual flu shot, pneumococcal vaccine every 10 years, for regular spirometry. Why regular spirometry, lung testing? It's simple, you can do it in the GP's office. A lot of GPs now do it in their office. In, a, in Edmonton, you can get it at the lung labs within a week, okay? The GP can get, none of this wait in six months like it was three or four years ago. You can get it next week. Um, because we want to know if your uh, lung function is going off. If it's trickling down, there are three kinds of patients with um, alpha-1 version of COPD. Ones who are stable, ones who are declining, their lung function is declining slowly, and those who are declining rapidly. And the indication, one of the indications of the moment for augmentation therapy is if you're declining rapidly, okay? So we want to know what's happening to your lungs, how it's getting on whether we're holding your own, okay? And liver function testing. Uh, is your liver going off over time, okay? So that should be checked regularly. Um, patients who have uh, alpha-1 livers have an increased chance of getting liver cancers as well. But if, if your liver function tests are normal, then you don't have to bother about that. Next thing to do is give up smoking. Not easy. Uh, I got patients who can give up crack quicker than, easier than they can give up smoking. Nicotine is highly, highly addictive, but it doesn't damage your lungs. It's the crap that's in the cigarettes that damages your lungs. So that's the principle of nicotine replacement. You can have all the nic nicotine you like, you can have the gum, you can have the little cigarette thing, you can have the patch. The nicotine is what you're addicted to, the other stuff is what's killing you, okay? Very few people die of nicotine addiction. They have to take a lot of nicotine to raise their blood pressure and their pulse, okay? But if you're addicted, I'll give you the nicotine as much as you like. Don't smoke. Don't smoke pot either. It's just as bad for your lungs. And if you need medication to give up smoking, ask for it. They're all covered. Uh, Verinoclean, Champix, uh, a lot of, most of the private plans cover that because they want people back at work, okay? So they want people to not smoke. Uh, Blue Cross is much slower on that, okay? But you can get it. You can get it 
by special authorization. That means GP has to fill in two extra pieces of paper saying you've tried nicotine patch and you've tried nicotine gum and you've tried everything else. And he's counseled you about giving up smoking and you've tried all this, and then you can have it, okay? But they'll treat you when you get in the hospital with the lung cancer from smoking, but they won't pay for you. Don't get me going, okay? <laughs> And you should ask for referral to a COPD specialist. If you got alpha one, um, I'm not knocking my colleague, but we have other things to do. And I'm interested in respiratory diseases. But if you have funny hearts things, um, you know, I'm a bit slower on those. And you know, your family doc might be great at maternity, he might do all the deliveries. He may look after the kids. He may have an interest in bowel disorders, you know. So get referred to a COPD specialist, okay. What can the physicians do? First thing we do is identify all our patients with COPD, duh. Um, hard to get people to do, especially when people who have early COPD don't present because they think it's just a smoker's cough. But actually they've got lung damage and if you give them spirometry, you can scare that what's it out of them. Um, by showing them that you now have the lungs of an 80-year-old and you're only 40. You know, would you like to give up smoking? Okay. Um, I will help you. Uh, you can't say, would you like to give up smoking? You have to say the second bit, and I will help you. Um, we should confirm the diagnosis. It's no use me writing has COPD in the chart if I haven't got any evidence. I couldn't say, you've got blood pressure just looking at you. <laughs> you know, you have to actually measure it. <laughs> Okay, so we should measure the lung function before we say someone's got COPD. I would recommend um, screening according to the CTS guidelines. That's what we should do. Except, I don't think they're tight enough. I would go back to the 2003 ATS guidelines which say all smokers should be tested. Especially, should we just be screening all our young smokers? Any 20 year old who smokes? Say, oh, you know, I see you're having trouble smoking. I think you should have an alpha-1 test. What? Because if you're a smoker and you've got alpha-1, you're in big trouble, pal. Um, or should we just screen all our COPD patients like the 2003 guidelines? It's up to you. We'll talk about that later. Thanks very much. Thank you.